My name is Ethan. I am a freelance videographer with Golden Toucan. That's my production company here in Fort Wayne. And I'm really excited to tell you a little bit about this crazy monster that I have constructed. I don't spend a lot of time with a lot of people who understand video production or cameras or anything like that so I didn't really realize how strange this rig was and how unbalanced it was to have a very expensive body and a very cheap lens put together. In fact I paid more I think for this Photodiox uh, e mount to f mount adapter than I did for this used 50 millimeter lens. We have the FX6 cinema camera with the AF Nikkor 50 millimeter 1.4D lens. This is a lens that does not focus on the Z bodies and is uh, of course also a manual focus when using an adapter on this Sony camera. You may not agree, but this is actually one of the most artistic videos that I've ever made. Uh, being in that I just went to go make pleasing images and obviously I've got a little bit of a gimmick going with my weird mismatched lens and body thing going but for the most part I was just out there to try to make pleasing images and so that's one of the projects that has a little bit more artistic merit than a lot of the other things I make and a lot of times I just feel like a technician you know putting the pieces together and using the right specs to make a product and obviously I'm making this whole video talking about all the tech specs and stuff, but that's because I'm trying to share my process. Having to write down and, and articulate what exactly I chose to do helps me understand it in a deeper level as well. So you may not think this was a very artistic video, you might disagree with that, but for me this was definitely something where I just went out and shot and tried to make pleasing images and that's kind of a unique experience for me. There are two filmmaking tropes that I wanted to experience and use for myself and try to explore a little bit more about. The first one is handheld filmmaking. So the idea of holding the camera instead of putting it on a tripod or using a gimbal. Lots of filmmakers talk about handheld video and why it's so important and why these white mirrorless cameras can't uh, give you good stabilized footage when you're just holding it with your hand. And I just wanted to try and experience that with this body and see what all I came up with. 
The other trope I wanted to interrogate in my video was the idea of using vintage lenses for video. This trope comes from the idea that lots of vintage lenses have nice manual focus, which my newer Nikon lenses unfortunately do not have, and even the Sigma lens that I use with my FX6 does not have a nice manual focus throw. And then also aperture rings that can be modified. Now, fortunately this lens doesn't have the ability to gently modify the aperture ring, it has to be done electronically, but the idea still stands that uh, vintage lenses have some advantages when it comes to video production. So what did I learn about handheld video? Well, basically what I learned is that it's easier in 120 frames per second and 60 frames per second than it is at 24. Pretty much as soon as I got home, I saw a little bit of the footage, I knew that I needed to put something else onto my rig in order to make it a little heavier so that there was less handshake. For me, the easiest way to increase the weight is, number one, to use any other lens. Two of my three other lenses that I use on this body are much heavier and balance a lot better, and I know that those would add a little bit of extra weight. Also, I used my smaller size battery. This is the U60. And I must have like a U40 or U20 or 15 or something. I don't know, the one that comes with the camera, that one's super light as well. So anytime I go handheld, I will at least use this battery because I can feel it in my hand. It's it's a big boy battery. And then the other thing is adding a monitor. I, so I've got my NATO rail up here that I could use to put my uh, monitor on here. At that point, you can either add an NPF battery, which adds a little bit more weight, or slap that V-mount battery on the back here, and then you've really got some weight going for you. I'll throw some of the weights of my camera up here so I can let you know what kind of weight I think is probably better for uh, recording. I mean, to be honest, my footage looked fine at 120 frames per second. I didn't feel the need to stabilize or crop in or anything like that, but at the same time, uh, I think a little bit less shake probably would do me well. When I use the FX6 to cover events, uh, I definitely use a monopod with a video head and some big wide legs. I think that's the best way to mitigate the fact that this camera doesn't have any kind of IBIS. Uh, whenever I use my Z6 and Z6 II, I always use the IBIS. Pretty much anytime it's on and not on a tripod, I have the IBIS on because it just smooths out all the little things, whether it's pictures or anything pretty much. I, I find it very effective and in sport mode you can get nice handheld pans and stuff like that for when your camera isn't built up all that big. I can definitely build up my Nikon cameras with a lot of the same accessories. I definitely use a lot of things interchangeably between this camera and my Z cameras because I kind of bought things with the thought process that they could be used by both of my systems. But this camera is obviously easier to build out for a rig because it's already got two really great handling options. This handle can be turned and put really low and you've got controls on both of these two things. So this camera is just begging to be rigged out where the Nikon cameras, a cage and a top handle and a monitor, it's really a comfortable place for them to be too. And so because that rig itself isn't that uh, heavy, I find that using a few more accessories with the Nikon cameras really helps even them out. And then also using that IBIS pretty much all the time. There were some small differences that I noticed when looking back at the footage, but for the most part, without comparing this lens directly to my Nikon Z 50mm, I really have no way of being able to tell them apart. The sensor in the FX6 and all of my Z bodies as well is just so dang sharp. I think even a, a more soft lens is still going to look pretty sharp on those bodies. Maybe I, I don't understand part of my lens physics or something like that. <laughs> From what I can tell, FX6 footage pretty much always looks like FX6 footage, or at least with this lens it does. I'm sure there are older lenses. I'm sure if you put a Helios on here that you will get some more dreaminess and some less sharpness. But for the most part, the footage that I got out of here to me looks extremely sharp. And I know that for a fact because, because of this beast right here. I don't know if you can see that. Flex on them. Because of this beast right here, I actually got to edit this video in better quality mode. So my footage just looked incredible. And I've got my dual monitor set up. So I usually have either a 27 or 34 inch monitor completely covered with just footage. This was an incredible editing experience. The M1 
Ultra <laughs> Studio edits the XABC codec like a dream. So this was a really fun experience as my first kind of big video with my new computer. It was really nice to be able to edit in better quality mode. And the disconnect between my calibrated monitors up here and playing it on my TV and on my iPhone has never been less. The fact that I can export a copy of my, I'll just do it right now, I don't, I don't care. I'll export video right now and show you how fast it is. 4K H.264, better quality, right to frame my own. We'll start the export right now, just because it's so easy to do on this computer. Uh, but anyway, it's incredible to work with a machine just like this. We're already almost halfway done with the export. No fans, no heat. If my Intel Mac was doing this, the, wait, 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 you wouldn't be able to hear me anymore. It'd be taken off like a jet engine. I, I have to have my Intel Mac off when I record. The Ninja V, which is a filmmaking accessory, has louder fans than the M1 Studio, which isn't even a filmmaking accessory for on set. It's possible that this Nikon lens isn't really a vintage lens per se. I looked up online, it seemed like it was manufactured between 86 and 95 which yes, was a long time ago, you you old fart. So those were the main things that I wanted to experience and look into for filming this video. I wanted to see if handheld filmmaking really struck my fancy and was something that I was capable of doing. I wanted to see if vintage lenses really did all that much to image quality and if it was a reason for me to sell all of my native Z glass and get a bunch of vintage lenses for video. And I wanted to see what it was like to just try and go make some pleasing images and try to make something a little bit more artistic. And I'm really happy with how all those items turned out. Here are a few other production notes from this outing. When it comes to using the FX6 handheld, I think one of the other things that helps it out besides its design and it's a bit of a bigger stature is that it has a really great rolling shutter performance. Unfortunately, the Nikon Z bodies don't quite have very good rolling shutter performance. And so using this handheld, I think is a little bit better. Obviously there's nothing in my shots that I did that were had those really tight whip pans. But even that being said, I, I don't think there was any wobbling or straightness problems uh, in the footage, even at 120p. So definitely a point for the FX6. I shoot everything on the FX6 at XAVCI. Looking at the Doug Jensen class, Excuse you. Looking at the Doug Jensen class, he kind of convinced me that there's really no reason to record long GOP, the more compressed uh, codec with this camera, simply because if you're going to use it, then use it. If you're going to compress it, then use a different camera or, or think about using your phone. Maybe that's a little bit of a harsh way of putting it, but this camera really shines with the XAVC i codec, and I've never had a problem, even on my Intel. MacBook Pro from like 2017, the Kodak ran pretty well on those machines. And so I use XAVCI, S Gamma 3 dot Cine, and for monitoring, I ended up using Caleb Pike's A7S 3 a LUT, but I ended up using the Alistair Chapman LUT for the final grade. That's kind of my base layer. I tried both of those two, and I really just liked what Alistair was doing with that one. So I used the Alistair V Look V3 native. That's the let that I ended up using for the actual editing. I typically fall into that YouTuber trope where I'm really excited about big, big bokeh. I want the maximum amount of bokeh at all times. When I was shooting this video, I wanted to kind of push back against that. Even though this lens, one of the coolest things about it, and while I'll keep it around, even though I have better 50 millimeter lenses, like quality wise, autofocus wise, obviously, even though I have those, I'm gonna keep this lens around because it is that 1.4. And if there are shots where I feel like I want that look, I don't have any other 1.4 or 50 millimeters. The Sigma 35 millimeter I have is a 1.2. I use that lens because the FX6 autofocus is so good. 1.2 can be autofocus and that's a pretty incredible thing that not a lot of other cameras can do. So on this shoot, I stayed between the f-stops around 3.5 to 5.6. Uh, it was a nice dreary, cloudy day. So my light was super even, which actually made shooting very easy. I didn't really realize that until I started thinking more about how many shadows and things I would have had to deal with if the sun was out a little bit more. But I wanted to obviously capture a lot more architecture and wide open spaces and 
You just don't need those lower f-stops to get that kind of look. Another reason I shot this episode a little bit more closed off was because I was trying to replicate and I was inspired by the intro shots that they use in Kim's Convenience. So if you go on Netflix and watch the theme song or take a look at the episodes, the interstitials that they have to introduce the new settings, they have these really cool shots where they look at people, especially like enjoying themselves on the streets of Toronto. I better look up where this show takes place. Yes, Toronto. I am a Canadian citizen. So they have establishing shots that are taken around different parts of Toronto. They really focus on people and people enjoying nightlife and people walking around the city streets. Because it was raining here in Fort Wayne and because it's Fort Wayne, I didn't really get to record a whole lot of people and I'm actually not super comfortable recording people on the street either, uh, especially with a big camera like this. People just don't comprehend the idea that a regular person would just own a camera like this and then walk around and film them. They're going to assume you're part of a TV show or part of the news or something like that because I don't know. People in Fort Wayne just have small amounts of life experience, I guess is the nice way I can put it. Well, they don't have the same life experience as me. But anyway, all that being said, uh, those interstitials, they just kind of record people walking around and that's kind of what I wanted to emulate with some of my shots. Now, I can very clearly tell that in those interstitials, they pretty much always record them on a tripod and they're always a lot more focused on people. And because it was rainy, like I said, uh, I didn't really have the ability to record a lot of people, so I focused more on architecture. So that's where things are a little bit different. They also, they use like a fluid head and it always seems like it's really loose and kind of spin around like that, uh, which is a very cool look and not really something I went for in this edit. Also, it's not, it's slow motion. This was all slow motion, which I thought fit the lo-fi theme a little bit better. So I ended up having some trouble with my follow focus during the recording. And when I got home, I was really confused because I tried reattaching things to see if I could replicate the problems and try to figure it out. And I put it on more correctly, I think, the second time. And so I, I feel like kind of a loser. I didn't end up seeing exactly in the footage where it was focusing to infinity that I was having trouble with, which if you look at the footage, a lot of it is shot at infinity. So unfortunately, it really caused me some trouble. But uh, I think what I found is that when I have this angle, no, when I have this angle here, with the follow focus and then this is more straight on which i know that's how it's supposed to be for some reason i just wanted to have it more close together there this angle was a little bit more this way but once i figured that out i have no problems getting through both sides of the focus range isn't it weird that we have to do this we have to put this in front of our faces just to show people things so weird i say that is one of the reasons i love shooting on a phone because Everything's in focus all the time. It's awesome. You don't have to worry about it. Anyway, one other production note. I brought the Peak Design travel tripod that has another... Look, I just can't stop flexing. I've got the FX6, I've got the Mac Studio, and I've got the Peak Design travel tripod in carbon fiber. Step to me. I guess the only non-flex I have is that this is not a 120D. It's a, a flat light so that I don't have to worry about all the space that that big... 120D takes up with the with the softbox, but I didn't end up using the Peak Design travel tripod at all. But I still think it's the best piece of equipment because it's the only tripod that you will actually bring with you all the time, and and then maybe use it if you needed to. You know, it's rugged, it's light, and it can fit something like the FX6 with a weight on it and be super clutch when you need it. And if you're walking around with a tripod, I, I just can't imagine running a gunning with any other tripod besides the Peak Design one. It would just be too much hassle for what you would get. I think a monopod with running gun situations, again with the FX6, is totally a legitimate workflow. So that's about it. I hope you guys enjoyed this video. Um, I'm not sure what I'm going to do next. I'm probably going to do a little desk tour because I've been optimizing my desk for years now. Now that I have the Mac Studio, it's kind of in one of its final forms, I think. You know, I'm always moving and shaking and adding different things, but uh, with the 
all the discussions about monitors that video editors use. I'd love to talk about mine and why I use them and what I've enjoyed about them over using them for about two years now. So desk tour is probably up next. Um, but until then, I'm going to keep thinking of cool ways to use Nikon and cameras. Uh, I probably need to make a video at some point about why I, as a very staunch supporter of the Z6 camera, own this, not a Z camera. And uh, maybe someday I'll even rent a Z9 and compare it to the FX6 because they are very similar in price, but they offer vastly different uh, abilities and options and I'd be really interested to compare the two to one another. Thank you so much for watching. Uh, thank you to my couple of subscribers that have stuck around. I really appreciate you guys and I hope you'll be forgiving as I try different videos and different formats and try to figure out what this channel is even about. 